final term has started. The students of number 44 test pilots course can fly all the school's aircraft. Now to gauge them for what they are, weapons of war. OK, what we're going to do on this exercise is we're going to assess the Jaguar inertial system. And we're going to assess it for its operational aspects. Right? And that's, that's what you've got to start right from the beginning thinking. This is an operational aircraft. Its job is to go to war. Your job is to assess the aircraft. How well can the operational pilot fly it? How well can he use it? How well does it help him to find small targets and to drop the weapons on it? That's the game we're in today. All the students have flown the Jaguar on the low-level navigation exercise with a tutor. Now they are to fly it on their own as a test team. Two of the syndicate, Les Evans of the RAF and Nick Coulson of the Royal Australian Air Force, are going to look at the Jaguar's inertial navigation and weapon aiming equipment at high speed and minimum height. Today, Les is the pilot with Nick his observer in the rear seat. The exercise is not a test of their ability to fly the Jaguar, that is now proven, but to assess how well the guidance system performs under simulated battle conditions. Their Jaguar XX145 begins to roll along the long Boscombe Down runway for takeoff on the low-level exercise. When it is completed, the student test team must make a formal presentation of their findings. To help the team prepare the presentation, Les and Nick will record the details of the exercise. So you really want a few more details on the map than that. There isn't much on the map. It's, uh, it's fine if you're in a detailed area with lots of, lots of stuff on the ground. The moving map is showing the Jaguar's present position as one mile southeast of a waypoint, the two small lakes. Okay, I can just make out the lake. Uh, it's actually hidden slightly behind that hill, but the cross is uh, very close. And the map's slightly out. It's probably half a mile out, I'd say. Okay. Kind of shortly and updating now. The equipment also gives course, speed, and distance to the next waypoint, Alf's Tower, and updates with exact latitude and longitude. Okay, I can see Alf's Tower coming. Yes, the uh, kit's looking quite good. Okay, updating now. Okay, next target run. Next, the weapon aiming trial using the head up display. The simulated target, a dam in Wales. See the target area ahead. An update has come up to it. Keeps looking quite good again. It's pretty good. It's stabilised on one point, but it's not quite the right point. Okay. Okay, waypoint three next. It's looking quite good actually. Got the mast out to the right hand side. Updating now. The radio the tower, one. the last waypoint. Okay, going back to uh, to Boscombe. They are guided back safely by the electronics. But on approach to the busy airfield, they still need an old-fashioned lookout as well. See the Hawking wind tank at the end over on uh, Long Farmers. Making every sound. All three of the syndicate have now flown the exercise as command pilot. Les Evans was the last. They have already decided that they will be making certain recommendations about the equipment at the presentation. Well, the major recommendations um, were twofold, really. The navigational control unit, which is this box down here, which sits between the pilot's legs, was too low down for him to reach easily in flight. Um, when he's flying at low level, his eyes really want to be outside the cockpit, looking up at about this level. and. Uh, and the, the navigation control unit is set way down here, and to look at it, he needs to actually look into the cockpit and reach forward to operate switches on it, which he must do in flight at low level, um, which is not desirable. One of the other recommendations that we made was this WAMS panel, the weapon aiming mode selector over this side. We found a little hard to operate because of the size of the buttons. We found that with a glove finger, you still had to look at the panel and make sure you press the right button because it's quite easy to operate the wrong button. Uh, the labelling's not terribly good and in a high workload situation it, it was reasonably easy to make mistakes. That point was the field of view of this uh, head-up display, which is basically... Serge is criticising the head-up display. But wouldn't Jaguar squadron pilots have noticed the same defects? I think operational pilots are equally well aware of the limitations of, of the system. 
because they are using these uh, every day and they're fully aware that that panel, for example, is in the wrong place, it's far too low, I'm sure all the Jaguar pilots are aware of that. Um, I think what we're taught to do is not just to say it's in the wrong place, but explain exactly why it's in the wrong place and exactly what aspect of that panel is, is, is used in flight. So that subsequently people can say, well, we won't move necessarily the whole panel, we'll move these switches from it. Uh, and it's that sort of analysis that we're trying to be taught here. Working in the ground school, the three student test pilots begin writing up their first 30-minute presentation. They will have to deliver it before a highly critical and knowledgeable audience of tutors. But I understand that we don't have to do that. It doesn't matter whether you've got... Uh, or you, or you, you, uh, they know that every detail of the presentation must be beyond reproach. But there remain other duties to be fitted in. For example, the visit to British Aerospace at Hatfield, one of several such trips to industry and service experimental establishments at home and in Europe. The visits are popular, and already the students are looking at prototype aircraft with different eyes, the eyes of test pilots. And after that, leave them. If you see a, a, a fighter pilot in a transport aircraft, it's always very high. Mm. Mirko Zuliani and Serge Gilbert, after two-thirds of the course, are now skilled enough to be able to constructively criticize aircraft. Looking, looking at this air, aircraft, I mean, I could see this as a good replacement type thing for the Hercules. Yeah, but right. That's, I mean, that's, uh, that's, that's going to be no great it, problem, though, is it? Certainly so, not. The track of the, of the landing gear is larger than the uh, Hercules thing. The students are encouraged to discuss technical details on equal terms with the company test pilots and engineers. Doesn't matter. So you've only got to keep one door on the shelf rather than two. The reason for the visits is to let service test pilots get some idea of developments in the aircraft industry. On the other hand, it lets the constructors meet the military test pilots of the immediate future. Back at Boscombe Down, the Lynx is prepared for an exercise suggested by JT from Singapore. He wants to see how the helicopter handles with autopilot AFCS failure. I'm going to simulate the stick trim failure. OK, well, with the AFC failures then, the AFCS failures, what sort of things are you going to be looking at? What are you going to be assessing when you fail one of the lanes? But Mike Swales, the principal helicopter tutor, wants further details. Lane failure means failing entire sections of the equipment. Now, are you just doing single lane failures or are you using uh, you're going to evaluate the aircraft with a total AFCS failure? I'm going to do both. The visor JT is wearing prevents him seeing out of the aircraft. He can only see the instruments. He must fly by them. Mike Micklejohn and Bob Horton are to fly with him. The object of the flight is to see if the links can be controlled on instruments alone, without the autopilot, yet still remain suitable as a VIP transport. Try and uh, disengage your AFCS using the AFCS cutout. Okay, I'm simulating uh, a doubling failure by uh, inadvertently... The autopilot is disconnected. Okay. Yeah, controlling the aircraft, the aircraft pitch. Okay. What's happening now is he's flying the aircraft purely without any stabilization on it at all. It's just a raw helicopter apart from hydraulic assistance. And the aircraft's getting a bit uncomfortable right in the right. Yeah. From a qualitative point of view, in the back here, as you failed it, it was quite a lurch. I mean, imagine you're a royal person, and you're sitting in the back, not really know what's going on, with a gin and tonic in your hand, and suddenly that happened. The exercise is typical. The students are now evaluating aircraft and flying as test pilots, all very different from their past squadron experience. What we're now looking at is areas of grey, where we're asking these pilots to change their philosophies, that we're not asking them to do a good job with the aircraft, which they had to do when they were a squadron pilot. We're asking them now to, to uh, almost forget about that aspect of their training, to unlearn that. Now they have to say, um, look at the pure aircraft, look at the way it handles, the way it performs, and ask themselves, can it do the job? Not can they, the test pilot, do the job, but can the aircraft do the job? We put the students onto uh, basic aircraft to take away the, the learning process of learning to fly the aeroplane. Um, because it's a short course, we can't give them three or four hours practice on every aircraft they fly. If they go onto an aircraft like the Chipmunk, then they can get into it and within a few minutes they can fly the aeroplane. And then that can become the second nature and they get on with actually testing it as opposed to just learning to fly it. 
The exercise is called pilot's assessment. For the first time, students are testing a complete aircraft. Robin Tideman, away from Boscombe Down, is checking an army chipmunk in Middle Wallop. It's a typical trainer of the 1950s. But Robin is to look at its handling in terms of today's requirements. I'll give him one hour just to assess its handling qualities. Uh, what would you be doing? Taking it through a typical student profile and assessing its qualities in terms of handling primarily uh, to see how it behaves. As well as that, we're looking at any areas which might uh, prejudice the safe operation of the airplane. Although the Army still use the chipmunk as a trainer, it is a rarity these days because it has a tailwheel undercarriage. Robin Tideman is expected to fly it without further conversion training, though it is very different from the Victor tankers he used to fly. Indeed, very few RAF pilots have extensive experience of piston-engined aircraft. Robin climbs the chipmunk to 3,000 feet to begin his handling tests. At Boscombe Down, he has been trained to set aside his considerable experience and to put himself in the position of a nervous student on his first solo. A steep 360 degree turn. Robin notes the precision and harmonization of the controls, the hallmark of a good basic trainer. No vices here. The weather is not ideal, but just good enough for a test spin. No vices here, either. From a dated aircraft to one of the latest. Harry Fail is at Old Serum, one of the world's earliest airfields, to put a prototype Optica through its paces. Writing forms an indispensable part of all test flying. Harry begins by plotting the Optica's turning circle. The unconventional Opticas are seen as an inexpensive helicopter substitute. However, James Giles' brief is held against the background of a recent fatal crash. Okay, part of this test will also be the accelerated starts. Yes because being on the scene again, the pilot might be in a tight turn, looking outside the cockpit, not concentrating on his instruments. And I want to check out what information he gets from the aircraft behavior that he's approaching the star. You're obviously aware there has been an accident. Yeah. Um, obviously, we don't know why at the moment, um, but it was in that sort of maneuver, and that's the sort of thing you need to check on aircraft like this. Bear in mind what it's going to be used for. So I presume this will go on to the accelerated, um, accelerated stall. Yes, got... this, it comes, accelerated stall comes a little bit later. Harry has prepared the cards for each phase of his test flight. On these, he will jot down the data for his Optica report. I will look there. If the pilot is able to uh, put in a certain amount of angle of bank and can leave the controls free, yes. because he might take, have to take pictures, Certainly. you know, or just looking around, doing something else with his hands. Exactly. In other words, he's looking out, he's looking at the, the ground. What is the aircraft doing yeah. when he's not uh, in, in a closed loop situation? First thing is flying off grass. Have you actually flown off grass no, before? It's, right. It'll be the first time. Right. Harry failed. A Luftwaffe F-4 Phantom pilot thoroughly evaluates this unusual aircraft. On the test pilot's course, simply flying an aircraft, however well, 
is not sufficient. The students have to assess the aircraft's characteristics, both good and bad, and then write a clear and concise report. The third light aircraft to be tested is the prototype Trago Mills, here landing at Boscombe Down, to be flown by Dave Southwood, guided by his tutor, Tim Allen. You are assessing the aircraft from the very moment you start out walking towards it. Virtually when you start looking at it, you start your assessing of it. So from every single aspect of the aircraft, everything you do with it, everything you touch, everything you handle, everything to do with it, you're assessing it. Right. Bearing in mind throughout that it's relating to the role of the aircraft. Now, I know it's a prototype aircraft and it's a civilian aircraft, but we are assessing it for the role of primary trainer, like the chipmunk or the bull. Sure, yes. Okay, let's have a look at your cards. Stalling is a very important aspect for primary trainer, so have a careful look at it. But the last time you did stalling, you had, well, two flights, one hour each. Yes. Here you've got about two minutes. Yes. So there's the change there. You've got to get done quickly and efficiently. It's obviously got to do aerobatics nicely, and I see you're going to get your stick force per G off that. That's a good idea. Also look at the performance of the aircraft. I know this is a handling assessment, but at every stage try and wind in the performance and the fuel usage and so on. So here, on the overshoot, with the full flap down as for landing, the climb may be rather poor. Yes. So have a look at the performance aspect of that. It is primarily a handling assessment. Yes. But your feelings are the most important thing, and the numbers which you take will back up any deficiencies which you found. It is, after all, a new prototype yes. aircraft. It's the only one in the world. Dave is to be accompanied by Air Marshal Jeff Cairns, himself a retired RAF test pilot and former commandant of Boscombe Down. He is now on the other side of the fence, for he is the director of the company which built the aircraft. He will act as Dave's flight observer. And, uh, you want to adjust the rudder red, red pedals first uh, before you do anything else, before you strap it. Um, right, at the bottom you've got a cloth and ammeter suction for the... This small trainer is very different from the Buccaneers Dave is used to. But as a test pilot, he will be expected to be able to fly any aircraft. This pilot's assessment, like the others, has to be completed in one hour. Not really long enough to test a brand new aeroplane. To help with his report, Dave has the usual voice recorder. Okay, watch it. Three, two, one, now. One at the second to the right. A careful lookout and a spin. For Dave, we'll need to test the trainer's ability to recover. Pilot's assessment, like all flights, has its paperwork. And I actually wrote about 75 sides of writing, I think, after just one hour's worth of flying. So nowadays, flying can never be fun anymore. You tend to go out there, and the first thing you do is get in the aircraft and think, Phew, don't like the cockpit, feel the view not too hot, controls are a bit, bit hard. And so you're, you're forever 
analyzing everything you look at. James Giles has Harry's Optica report. It represents some 20 hours of writing for an hour of flying. Harry, uh, that was a very good report. Thanks very much. As you appreciate, that was actually a pre-production aircraft. It was a prototype. And there are a couple of things that you probably weren't aware of. One was that the uh, port wing was about two degrees out of alignment, and it was misrigged, which I'm sure accounts for some of the facts you've come up with on the spiral stability, uh, and indeed the, the stall. And the other one was the elevator effectiveness, which, uh, which you mentioned near to the ground, and they are actually uh, working on that at the moment, mm -hmm. and certainly the production model should have a new elevator. In ground school, the three-man test team are about to make their presentation of the Jaguar low-level exercise. They have found writing the presentation hard work in the limited time available. Only 30 minutes are allowed for its delivery, and the expert audience will have to be convinced of the students' recommendations. The principal weapon aiming modes assessed were CCIP with RADOLT ranging, target of opportunity, planned, tracked PLF and regress PLF attacks all in both Barrow and RADOLT ranging. All the technical data is there, but in addition the knowledgeable audience is looking for style in presentation. This is vital if test pilots are to be able to convince civil servants and aircraft manufacturers to say nothing of air marshals and admirals of their findings. It doesn't matter how good the tests were or how skilled the test pilots. If the presentation fails, they have failed the whole exercise. This detracted from the pilot's ability to look at the targets and to maintain safe terrain clearance. That concludes my weapon aiming um, assessment. I'll now call upon Flight Lieutenant Nick Coulson to summarize our uh, assessment of the Jaguar Navois. Thank you, Liz. In summary, we found the NAVWES to be a reasonable aid overall. However, there was a lot of room for improvement. Specifically, the aircraft must not be released to the low-level bombing role. The staff make their notes for the critique which will follow. One point is already clear. The VA's visual aids are certainly not flowing as they should. This is the actual uh, position of the pilot's eyes when it sits in the cockpit. You can see on this slide that the PCP underneath the head-up display is almost completely hidden. This is due to the fact that pilots now in, enable, in order to see the head-up display correctly, are... There is some sympathy for the French student, Serge Aubert. It's not easy to lecture to experts in a language not your own, and that will be taken into consideration when the presentation is marked satisfactory and we recommend that these main switches should be positioned in the pilot's field of view. There are a number of further recommendations included in the report. Thank you for your attention gentlemen, that concludes our presentation. The three students withdraw to allow the staff to discuss and mark their presentation. The marks are out of ten. Right, start from the top. The timing, I made about two minutes over so we'll give them an eight for that. The VAs, relevance and quality, what do we think about those? Well, I thought some of them were a bit fast, the way they were put yes. up, and also yes. when, uh, at one point, when Nick was trying to point out switches, he was waving the pen over. I wasn't sure whether he knew where they were either. Mm. So I think they could have made better use of their VAs. Yeah. They had most of the things there. They had most of the conclusions right, though I think they overstated some. Um, on the weapons aiming side, uh, and it didn't come over clearly, likewise on the nav side, I thought, um, for example, the nav system accuracy was awfully poor yes. slide. Can I take on that one number six I, again? Well, yeah, difficult. I, difficult. I, I, would I, say, I, I'm going to say five myself. I, I, I don't think that they display to me an, a, an overall okay. knowledge of the system, taking it across yeah, the whole okay. of the group. Mm -hmm. Surge was very quiet, they could hardly hear him, and then it went off at uh, a high rate. Uh, it was difficult to understand sometimes. And Les um, actually read his script, which is what I would expect, yes. but he didn't know his script, which meant there was no eye contact with the audience, and it was fortunate that we could take our eyes away from him and look at the, the slides, otherwise you know, we could have somebody <laughs> in the corner reading it from a book, really. They didn't put things into context. They didn't yeah. explain why. They'd suddenly come up with a conclusion. And there was no lead-in, no, no build-up to it. Yeah. I think mine was a generous five on that. Yeah, I, well, I certainly have a five for that. Yes, I'll yes. agree with that. The B Syndicate did pass, just. But how did they feel about the low marking of their presentation? 
Well, that presentation, in fact, was quite rushed. Um, we only really had three days when the three of us could get together. Um, and those days were, were fairly busy days. We were already flying anyway. So um, I think you could say that we, we actually pre prepared that presentation on about two or three nights, um, which is part of the reason why it was a bit of a shambles and, uh, and things weren't actually uh, as well coordinated as they should have been. A Chinook lands at Boscombe Down for an exercise with a difference. Yeah, whether we need it or not, we do it every year. Uh, often it gets cancelled due to weather, and we have a very narrow bracket because uh, if we don't get it in today, we'll probably have to cancel because we can't afford the extra time. But I think the guys enjoy it. So we'll see what happens. But it's my first time in the sea. <laughs> I'd rather do that than land on land for the, uh, the first time. <laughs> Yes, about 13 times. Bit of fun, why not? Part of the course. Shall we say they will be guided out of the aircraft and assisted? It is the annual parachute jump into Stutland Bay. The jumps are made from a thousand feet, at which height the Chinook is only just clear of cloud. Water was reported as freezing. The jump is voluntary, but nearly all the test pilot students and staff took part. Royal Marines hauled the sodden officers aboard the rescue boats without ceremony. How was it? Oh, it's tremendous. It's the sort of thing every BBC film man should do. No, not again. Did you enjoy it? Excellent. Super. All of it. Uh, the being best, sick in the aeroplane. Yeah, being sick on the way down, I think, was the best bit. <laughs> Good game. Yeah. Did you enjoy it? Yeah. Marvellous. Would you do it again? Yeah. Who's got the beer? No, Who's we are the beers. Who's got the... Really. Uh, well, we say it's got negative NV. Dave Southwood, ever the test pilot, awards the parachute handling marks. Control, not bad. His next flight will be very different, for he and the other students will be test flying modern military aircraft that they have never before flown.